Hey y'all, welcome back and welcome to another Side Trip Sunday. This week we're going to take you along as we visit Brookshire, Texas, just west of Houston, and stop in at a little family owned and operated distillery, Shire Distilling Company. So stick around. our production area that we so to put things in perspective if you look up there behind you that's a 50 gallon still that little copper setup that's what we started out on so when we got our permit we got our physical address we got our still that is that bottle of centaur you got uh -huh. that was distilled on that little 50 gallon still it's an all copper setup and it's kind of like right in between hobby level and commercial level being at a 50 gallon size we did, we, that Centaur was done in collaboration with No Label Brewery, where they had an L to M milk stout that had gone soured, which makes for a horrible milk, milk stout. It makes for a great whiskey. So we took 650 gallons of that milk stout, and we ran it all through that little still up there. And after distilling it all out, we put it all into a standard 53 gallon uh, American Oak Char Level 3 barrel. Let it age out for over two years in that barrel, which anything, more than two years becomes a straight whiskey. So that is a straight malt whiskey that we created there. And that was our very first distillate that you have. So we only have one barrel of it. It's our oldest product. And once it's gone, it's gone. That's something wow. that's never gonna be replicated again. Look at that, you and better that, save it. Is that what you bought? <laughs> yeah. And so a little history behind the name, we did a naming contest online with all of our followers. And one fellow came up with the name Shire Centaur. So if you notice, our logo is the Shire Horse. That's on everything. Well, with that bottle of Centaur, when the fella mentioned you know, the, on the naming contest doing Centaur, oh, he explained why, and he says the coming together of half man, half horse, and that product is a coming together of a brewery and a distillery. We felt like it was a very okay. suiting name. Yeah. So the one time we ever went out of the norm of changing our logo, which you typically don't want to do, you want to always keep your brand and embed it in people's brains, mm -hmm. But the centaur, we actually changed the logo. If you've noticed on the bottle, there's an actual centaur, not a horse. Oh. So, so one time we went outside the, the bounds of our, sticking to our normal Shire logo. So it's a very neat, very unique product and it's a wonderful, very flavorful product. So that's that was done on the little still. Aside from that, we had a few other little runs done on it. And then that thing most definitely could not keep up with the production needs that, that were required. And so that's when we upgraded to what's our 600 gallon system. Yes, so sir. that 50 gallon still has since been retired. It's a museum piece and part of the tours now. Yeah. And this here is a 600 gallon still house. So we actually have one of the largest in the Houston surrounding areas. We're, we're tied for second place, I believe, with a Yellow Rose Distillery. Wow. So, so when did y'all start? We, we were established 2017, which is, we, we started some of the groundwork uh, the year before that, but when we got our actual permit to legally distill spirits, that is what we consider our actual establishment date, which was June of 2017. So only a little over three years we have been in operation. It's a family owned and operated uh, distillery. It's me, my father, they all met up front, and then my mother, who's on her way up here. Family owned and operated, and my father's a veteran as well, so family owned, or, I mean veteran owned as well. So we just it started out with me and my dad uh, working our full-time jobs and then right after work coming up here and running the distillery damn near the rest of the day. I mean, we'd, we'd get up 4.45 in the morning. We both were, were working oil and gas at the time. I was working with Occidental Petroleum and he was working with a company called Alta Mesa. He's an IT manager and I was working with the reservoir management team. And then right a little over two years ago i quit my job with oxy because we needed someone up here full time when shipments would arrive when shipments had to go out it was just we couldn't handle the the meet the bit the needs of the business with us always at our our full-time job right. so he continued working his full-time it management job something we needed something to continue funding the dream and while he was doing that i was up here still am doing full-time up here just holding down operations so I'm operating the equipment, we're our own marketing team as well, we're our own everything. 
So, do y'all sell outside of here, like in some yes. of the specs so and stuff are, like that? So, of the seven products that we have up there, five of those, which are our core products, which I was explaining earlier, those five core products are in liquor stores. We're in about a hundred different liquor stores currently, and wow. we're in the in the works of trying to get into another thirty-four, uh, more around the San Antonio area and Austin area. But we're day by day steadily doing what we can to try and promote market grow spread around texas even more and then hopefully one day get out of state and out of country as well so well the other day i saw that you know the guy that owns tito's is one of the richest men in the world he's one of the newest billionaires in yeah, the world he's yes some money definitely and he they were the ones that started being able to distill, distill in texas first in right texas, yes. and when did that happen do you no uh, i can't recall the exact date but i mean it really wasn't that long ago i'd say maybe no, it somewhere wasn't. like in the mid 90s if yeah, i had to throw I, a I, random it, guess out there yeah, distillation want to get texas to allow it. so it, right. distillation is still very new for texas and yeah mm -hmm. he basically he contested texas law and said there's nothing in here that says you cannot legally own and operate a distiller in texas and doing so he won in court and he opened the very first legal distillery in Texas. His permit is DSP-1. He, he, is, he is the first. And us, we are 112. So so it's not like a lot of people have done exactly. it still. So yeah. you're looking at 20 years later, give or take, we're 112. Wow. Now, from the time that we got ours to current day, there might be just a rough guess, maybe 80 more. So you're looking at probably about 200 distilleries in Texas now. So even then, for how big and vast of a state Texas is, considering also, we got three of the largest cities in the US, San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston. Yeah. Texas is a big state and it has a big population as well. And to only have 200 distilleries approximately across Texas, is it's, it's, it's still very young in the state. So this big box over here looking unit, that's called a spirit safe. Spirit safe, has windows on the top, has lids on it. All it does is keeps your, uh, your high proof spirits safe. So when product comes off your still, it's at a very high strength. Anything over 50% alcohol is flammable. So that spirit safe will keep your high proof spirits safe from an accidental spark or flame. Say someone just unknowingly just came walking through that door smoking a cigarette or something. And last thing you want is that coming in contact with a high proof spirit. You gotta treat it like gasoline. Mm -hmm. So spirit safe keeps the spirit safe in the name I guess and then next thing in line is in that back corner that little round unit that's a steam boiler that is how we heat up our system the steam boiler will basically runs off natural gas it'll heat up water which will then create a steam that steam is what heats our tanks up so these tanks they have a jacket around the outside of them they are double walled just like this is like a Yeti water bottle or a Yeti cup Yetis are double walled and that double wall does two things It'll insulate the tank extremely well, extremely well insulated. And number two is, in between those double steel walls, you have an empty airspace. We use that empty airspace. We can pump steam into that jacket, and that steam, it actually will not come in contact with any of the product, but it'll heat the product up through thermal transfer through the steel. So steam boiler heats up our tanks. The first tank here, this big one, so this whole system is a 600 gallon system. So all these tanks, 600 gallon capacity. That first one is our mash tun. The mash tun is where we're putting approximately 1200 pounds of grain. Your four common grains for doing a bourbon are corn, rye, barley, and wheat. So for our bourbons there, we have three of those grains in them, corn, rye, and barley. We have rye whiskeys out there that are aging and we'll eventually bring out some, uh, some weeded whiskeys as well. But as of now, we have not done any, any with wheat in them. But the mash tun, for a 600 gallon sit, uh, setup, we're putting about 1,200 pounds of grain at the proper ratios, and then we're adding water as well, bringing it to that 600 gallon mark. That steam boiler is filling that jacket with steam, and it's heating up that entire 600 gallon mash. While that's going on, you see that blue motor up top. We got it on several of these tanks. Those blue motors, those are agitator motors. Think of some big old sticks down in there that are just stirring everything up. I say sticks, it makes them sound like wood, but they're, they're, they're stainless steel. They're very strong and heavy. So we're stirring everything, we're agitating it, we're heating it up. What we're trying to do is break down that grain. We're trying to break it down and liquefy it. 
think of making like a thin bowl of oatmeal, kind of along that consistency is, is what we're making in there. When you break down that grain, you're releasing the sugar that's within it. The sugar is what we're after because that sugar will eventually become our alcohol. So we've done our mashing, we've broken everything down, we've liquefied it, we're now ready to transfer from that first tank to this next one. The way we do that, if you look down in that corner, you see a little thing with a wheel on it, or sitting on wheels, that's a carp pump. That little carp pump, we hook up a hose from the tank to the pump, from the pump to the next tank. This whole system runs off three phase power. That little pump there looks small, but it will empty an entire 600 gallon batch and fill it in the next tank five, 10 minutes max. That's it. Wow. wow. All of it moved over. Yeah. So now we have our next tank filled up. These two tanks here are identical. They are both fermenters. The reason we have two is because fermentation is one of the longest parts of the whole process of creating our spirit. So mashing will typically dedicate one day towards a mash day. And then fermentation, you're gonna dedicate approximately five days towards fermentation. So fermentation is where we'll open that hatch on top, we'll dump our yeast in there, the yeast will go through all 600 gallons and it'll find all that sugar that was released during the mashing process. The yeast is gonna consume that sugar and convert it over to uh, alcohol. The alcohol is, it will, we'll have approximately 9% in there, but just to make numbers easy, 600 gallons, let's say we got 10% alcohol, that means 60 gallons of pure alcohol out of a 600 gallon tank. So just to kind of make a visual of how much that is, we have a little sight gauge right here. That amount is 50 gallons. So that's about how much pure alcohol will be in this entire 600 gallon batch. It won't be sitting on top though. It'll, it'll all be mixed in. You, you call it a distiller's beer in the distillation room. We basically made a big old batch of beer. How I was mentioning earlier, how beer brewing mm -hmm. comes into play with the whole first portion of a, making a distilled spirit. Because you're doing mashing, fermentation in the beer making world as well. The only difference is breweries, when they make a beer, if they're making 600 gallons of beer, they're selling 600 gallons of beer. That's, that's all getting consumed. In the distillation world, you're making a 600 gallon batch of a, of, or a 600 gallon mash, that doesn't mean you're gonna end up with 600 gallons of whiskey at the end. You're gonna end up, because you're separating that alcohol, you're gonna end up, this system is sized out to make a 600 gallon batch of mash, which will then equate to approximately one barrel of final product, which is, the barrel is 53 gallons, so we'll end up with about 50, 60 gallons of pure product by the end of a distillation process, which means we have just roughly say 550 gallons of mash that will be left over in that still. So as I continue down the line, after fermentation, we now have alcohol in our product. It's, it's a distiller's beer. So real quickly, I'm gonna go over these. This white box and that tank right there, those work together as what's called a glycol chilling system. Think of how that steam boiler back there heats everything up. The glycol chilling system cools everything down. You need cooling in several different areas of the distillation world. One, for example, is fermentation. When you're fermenting your product, you wanna maintain between 80 to 90 degrees, but while fermentation is occurring, that whole batch is actually gonna be heating up. It'll, it'll heat up, it'll go over 90 degrees plus. It'll, it'll get to a point where it'll make the yeast die off and go inactive. You don't want that to happen. So, this is what I would consider a semi-automated system. We have a little control panel back here where we can put temperature set points on our tanks. And during fermentation, if those tanks start heating up, say we transferred everything over, we went home for the night to go to sleep, we set it at 85 degrees. It starts heating up, it hits 86 degrees, that chiller will kick on, fill that jacket with a cooling liquid and bring it back down to 85. So we can maintain our temperature set point with this system even when we're not up here. And so by the end of fermentation, the yeast is happy. It didn't get too hot in there, it didn't get too cold in there. Yeast is happy, which means it works uh, at the most effective rate possible and it converts all those sugars over to uh, alcohol. So now we're using that same little pump down there and we're transferring everything from the fermenter to our still. The still is where the magic happens. This is where, this is your additional step beyond the whole beer brewing world. 
This is where you're turning that distilled beer into a distilled spirit. And the way it works is we are pumping with that steam boiler, we are flooding that entire jacket with steam. Alcohol has a lower boiling point than water does. So alcohol will reach its boiling point at 172 degrees, pure alcohol will. Water reaches its boiling point at 212 degrees. So you got quite a bit of a difference in there. So if we were to heat that thing up and the temperature rises and rises, once it hits your, your boiling point of alcohol, that alcohol is gonna turn into a gas and start rising up through the system. But if we keep the temperature below 212, then we're never gonna boil our water, which means the water, which is also the mash and everything else, will stay inside of here. So boiling points is how you're separating the alcohol from the rest of your mash. Heat it up, heat it up enough to boil the alcohol, but not enough to boil all the water and everything else. That alcohol will turn to a gas. Gas is lighter than a liquid. So all the liquid stays in here, all the gas rises. As it rises, it goes through our whiskey helmet up here. And you asked a question about the copper earlier. You notice how the copper is only on the top half. Because the copper has a reaction with that, the alcohol vapor. And what it does is that alcohol vapor has sulfides in it. When it passes by the copper, the copper will pull those sulfides from the alcohol. Sulfides are what can give you a bit of an off taste. It can give you the headaches and whatnot. It, it, sulfides just make for a much less premium product. You can, this could all be stainless and we could still make a distilled spirit. It just would not be nearly as good as a distilled spirit that was made with a system that has copper in line. So the copper plays an important role in creating a good distilled spirit. So the gas passes through the copper. Copper pulls the sulfides off of it. That gas will, con so this is an enclosed system. So that alcohol vapor is gonna stay trapped the entire time. If, if we had an opening somewhere, we would have an alcohol vapor escaping. That'd be very dangerous. And we also wouldn't be able to recollect it to make our spirit. But this is all enclosed, so that gas rises up, it goes through, and you see how we got blue levers up there? Those, those are three-way valves. We got four of them. And those allow us to redirect that alcohol vapor through the system. Depending, depending on what we're trying to make. So this unit right here, that's a gin basket. If we want to make a gin, we would turn those two valves to redirect that vapor to come in through the side and then go back up out that top right side over there. And the way a gin works is that, that gin basket, we're filling, you would fill that up with botanicals. Your juniper berries, your citrus peels, all your different botanicals that you want to have in there. You fill that basket up, this neutral alcohol vapor will pass right through there and it is now getting flavored by those botanicals. Now it continues on down the line and you now have a flavored alcohol vapor, which is your gin. Right now, we bypassed that unit. We, we ordered this system with the gin basket because we do have future plans of making a gin, but currently we're, we're working on more like foundation kind of products. We're predominantly gonna be a whiskey distillery, so we're trying to get our rye whiskeys made, our weeded whiskeys. We want to get a bunch of different whiskeys done, start selling some now, and then leave some for aging as well. Because, you know, time is one of those things. We don't have a time machine. So <laughs> make, make your whiskeys early, get them aging, and let them start doing their thing. And then down the road is where we want to start experimenting with the gins and eventually put out, just like how we have a vodka, have a gin as part of our lineup as well. So we have not experimented with that at all just yet. We bypass it and we go over to this pipe. So that blue lever, we can redirect the alcohol vapor down and enter in the side of this copper column. This column, you see how it has little windows on it. Looks like a music instrument or something. So in between these windows, there are these copper plates that are called bubble plates. Those bubble plates, think of them as like a giant filter. You have an alcohol vapor that is going through your system and now it's entering in the bottom side of there. There might be some water and some impurities that got dragged along with that alcohol vapor. It's not just pure alcohol. There's some water that's with it as well that just so happened to get dragged along. When you pass through that column, those filters with their, or those bubble plates, what they're gonna do is they're gonna cause any of that water that got dragged along. When that water comes in contact with your plate, some of that water is gonna condense which means it's gonna turn into a liquid. Liquid is heavier than a gas, so the liquid will drip down here and then go across that pipe and get rejected back into the still. 
the gas will continue rising, which is our alcohol. So each time you pass through one of those plates, you're getting more and more impurities and water out of your alcohol to where by the time you come out of the top, you can have a very, very strong, pure alcohol coming out of there. So think of it this way, if like, if you had a cup with half alcohol and half water in there, if you took the whole water portion out, you only have half the volume, but you would have pure alcohol in there. Similar concept is going on there. We are raising the proof of our product because we're getting the water out, with, there's less volume now, but it is a much higher proof is what we're doing. The percent of alcohol that is initially entering that column compared to the alcohol percentage that's exiting there is a lot higher. And after that, the vapor will continue on down the line to this last unit, which is our condenser. The condenser is hooked up to that glycol chilling system. So that chiller will keep this whole condenser nice and ice cold. And as that vapor enters from the top side, it'll start cooling down and cooling down as it goes through it. And once it cools down below that 172 degree boiling point, it is now going to condense back into a liquid. When it turns into a liquid, it's all gonna flow off this little parrot over here. It's called a parrot. That's how you measure your, the strength of your alcohol on the fly, this little unit. But it'll basically it'll flow off that and go into our collection tank. So in essence, what we've done is we had a 600 gallon mash liquid with roughly 60 gallons of pure alcohol in there. We boiled the alcohol, which turned it into a gas. That gas went through our system, and then that gas got condensed back into a liquid and captured over there. So now all the alcohol is there, and the rest of the mash is here. With boiling points, we have separated the two. And that is how a distilled spirit is created. Yeah, well, that, I mean, the tasting was awesome. Yeah, it was. The cinnamon, what was it, what's it called? Shire Fire. Shire Fire. Shire Fire. I mean, that Shire Fire. Say it, that fast five times. That That is incredible. <laughs> we got a bottle to go on that. We bought us a bottle of that. That stuff is fantastic. When you're in Brookshire, make sure you come by and say hi. And uh, yeah, just fantastic experience. Great folks, good product. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed this side trip Sunday. We'll I see learned you a ton. Oh my gosh, so informative, so interesting. We'll see you on Wednesday. Safe travels. And happy camping. Bye. Bye.